And um, so now I'd like to welcome um, William, the Senior Engineering Advisor with Ministry of Building and Innovation and Employment. William will introduce his colleagues. Thank you for, for um, coming along. Um, we're trying to carry over from the session that was held on the 18th of July when we looked at the kind of the front end of the guidance and we obviously had not sufficient time to go on into the foundation. So hopefully there's a little bit of a link back to where we left off and then we'll go forward from there um, as we go forward. Right, I'd just like to introduce, I've got Murray Wood here, he's a CPN structural engineer with Oricon and Robert Kay, who's a geotechnical engineer, and he's also working for Oricon. Um, we're going to get both these chaps up to talk, and they're going to do a tag team through the session, so that should be very good. On the agenda, we have a number of items, so we're going to just touch the guidance very briefly and get into the geotechnical side of the exercise, what the engineer needs from the geotech engineer, so you can understand what's being sought when they take particular types of tests onto sites and go on into the design and talk a little bit about where the, the designs are applicable and we'll then we'll be ready to take some questions post that. So without further ado, I'm going to pass over to Murray and he's going to carry on from the first slide. Thanks William, uh, good evening all. Yeah, so um, no doubt you're all vaguely familiar with the, uh, the MU guidance, uh, what it does. Uh, so it's a, it, it was a document uh, put together post-earthquake and it's, it's generally to collect and direct um, uh, the accumulated knowledge and, um, and try and focus on what's important in addressing damage to uh, houses, residential uh, properties. Uh, one of the basis of the documents is that Past performance is the best indicator of future performance. I've had uh, 15,000 plus uh, earthquakes, um, and, uh, and and that gives an indication of how how the property behind and how the house itself uh, has uh, has behaved and will behave. Uh, it does recognise the need for flexibility, uh, even in its title. It's called guidance, um, so we uh, we work with that. Every site's unique. Uh, every house is unique, all the properties are unique, the geotechnical conditions, the foundation um, system, the layout of the house uh, and, and how it behaves in a, in, in a seismic event. Uh, there are common damage themes uh, that come through, um, uh, concrete cracks, um, timber moves, brittle finishes crack, uh, um, as well as that, liquefaction causes settlement. Uh, need to carefully consider the ground conditions and how they um, how they change from site to site and how they how they have affected how the buildings have performed um, and, and I'll, I'll I'll touch a bit on uh, on that um, and being Canterbury ground conditions were a large factor about how each house behaved uh, and and how it's uh, how it's damage varied. Uh, I'll just hand over to Rob now. Um, he'll take you through a bit of a, the, the geotechnical side of it and I'll uh, come back to. Um, build on that one. Sort of the height. <laughs> Hello. Yeah, I think. Uh, just briefly going to talk through the geotechnical aspects to lead on to what Murray is going to talk about from a structure perspective. That drawing or figure there is direct from the MBI and sort of a continuation from what William must have presented a few weeks ago if some of you attended. And it's generally an identification of uh, the different damage you can expect settlements. Looking at it from the left or the right, the other side, is a grand way you could think there's no leak faction. Why Technically, you could call it TC1, or going beyond Rangiora, West Melton, where there's gravel and weak faction is not an issue. So damage is not a, a big, you, you expect shaking damage, but not exactly below the ground. Most cases, probably you won't need a geotechnical engineer or much involvement. As you start moving forward, what tends to happen is more or less in Christchurch, as you come closer to the sea, Note that that stream there is representing the sea, 
but you sort of start getting water getting closer to the surface. As water gets to the surface, but also because the oceans kept moving back in and in, the soil is not as strong as it is as you go further out. The, set, the type of soil changes. You start getting the combination of water and loose soils, you start developing liquefaction. And that sort of represents that as you come closer, sort of closer to the, this other side, the thickness of the liquefiable layer, which is the thick layer in between, increases. But the effect is to the buildings is what sort of that drawing. More or less is trying to say that if you're closer to the edge, the difference you expect from settlement is not that great. But as you start moving away, your building may be sitting on one side, uh, which is good, which is relatively OK. The other side gets worse. And you start getting tilting and differential settlement. So that is sort of general land damage, minor, moderate, major, and very severe. Main thing is as you come closer to the free faces, where you have free faces, you expect lateral spreading or ground, massive ground cracks developing. And just to reiterate that, that is typical when you come to close to free surfaces, uh, uh, streams, and all that. But it can also occur in areas where historically you may not know but you had river channels coming in and out, and the ground on one side is different from the ground on the other side. Once the shaking comes in, one part of the ground uh, performs very well, the other side doesn't perform very well. And, and that's why uh, as you come to the side with major severe damage, if you go back to the MBA guidance and, and guidance, you start talking about TC1, TC2, TC3, where you have major damage, you're more or less coming to TC3 sites. And the when they have a geotechnical engineer involved, they'll be able to work out, depending on the level of damage, what kind of settlement you're having and what the issues are. And the main thing is the foundation damage is an indicator, a way, uh, and was used in to inform the categories in the MBI guidelines. It's not a rule, but you could say, you start moving from TC1, TC2, TC3 as you move across that diagram. Brief about technical categories, just to know that uh, TC1, the ground is generally OK. TC2, you're sort of starting getting into problems, but it's manageable. TC3, you definitely need geotechnical input. And simply because you're talking about huge settlements, poor performance. And by poor performance, you are meaning you turn to site you have big cracks, ground undulations, massive sand boils. Not to say that you, may, you can have one or two sand boils, but if, if it's, it's more than what's sort of normal, then you're sort of moving from TC1, TC2, TC3 category. And what, talking from a geotechnical perspective, how we involved and the steps we go through, the first thing we do is look at the Canterbury Geotechnical Database, which we call the CGD. And the CGD, ideally what, thanks to EQC, they started off, looked at, collected all this information after the earthquake. Everything was collected in one database. And all the geotechnical engineers in Canterbury who subscribe to it, as long as you put on information and, uh, and, and you're allowed to take it out, every investigation we do, we put it on there. So before we turn up to your site, we have all that information. And we start looking at things like, what kind of settlement has occurred on your site and wider site? Was there cracks or not? Were the cracks just on your property or beyond your property? Because if it's across, then it gives you a pattern, whether you have former infield channels or not, black maps, were there old streams or not? So the, how, where, where is the groundwater on your site? Is there any nearby investigation? And all that is building a picture that before you come to, to your site, we, get, we have an appreciation. And we, when you turn up to site, is confirming what we know or what we think is there and what is actually on site. Most importantly, when we turn up on site, is the first thing is we are trying to look at is the observed damage, more or less what we thought or what we expect. But what we also need from you is your, you're the person who knows more about your property to tell us as much as you can. Because it's all good me seeing a crack, but I, know, I may not know that that crack is there, say because you had 
a swimming pool which you backfilled. And, and, and all that information helps build a proper picture and you get a better solution or sort of more informed solution. And then if it so happens that we notice that there's poor performance of the site, then definitely recommend more investigations and more data. And that the scale increases, we start from shallow, uh, shallow where you just need minor repairs or minor foundation replacement to deep investigations. And that is the CPTs, ocon penetration tests, and boreholes. And the testing helps understand what the soil is doing near the surface and below the surface. Briefly, I'll touch through the different investigations. One of the techniques, and I'm intentionally not talking about shallow, because shallow is we do it, but normal cases when you do the shallow investigation, it's either to supplement the deep investigations, or it's in TC2 site where the repairs are easily manageable, in which case is not much import. For the deep, we have the CPT, and all it is, someone turns up with a truck, with a cone, pushes into the ground, probably you'll never notice. If it's one or two, they'll be done in an hour. But there is a lot which is picked up in that cone. We can find out where the water table is. We can find out the nature of the soil. And what I am showing there is on the upper scale is the information which comes from the contractors. Below is how we use it. We, we, we determine what the soil type is. We determine what your leak faction uh, potential is at the site. But idea we get from that information, we can work out how much crust you have, because it's not just a matter of the soil liquefies. Yes, of course, the fact that your house is damaged or it's poorly performing is because there was a leak faction in the first instance. But it's just giving us an understanding of how deep is that leak faction, uh, 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 those liquefiable layers. Say if you have a thick liquefiable layer, then it doesn't, it matters. But in, as far as the house is concerned, it won't, it won't be very much damaged because the layers are way below and you have a thick layer which balances out the settlement. If it's closer to the surface, then as an engineer, start thinking about more about it. Then you also define how much settlement occurred due to leak faction. And that informs moving forward. The MBI, through various experts and research, have put together comprehensive documents supported by trials and they go through foundation options depending on the damage is they expect in future earthquakes. So once you get, we know what kind of settlement you expect, then you can better inform what solution to adopt for your site. Then you also get to know the depth to the load bearing layer or bearing capacity as they call it. Then design parameters, that's a general term for we can use the information for whatever you want. The next is boreholes. Boreholes, we use the boreholes. Uh, we get the same information, more or less what we get from the CPTs, plus others. The unique circumstances where you require a borehole, and that is where they come and they drill through the ground and extract samples, is because the CPT, you don't exactly get physical samples. So if you're in doubt, then you get boreholes to know exactly what material you're working with and sort of better inform the design. If at all you're in the margins when you're not sure the ground, what the ground is exactly doing from the CPTs, you can also take those physical samples for laboratory testing. And still all we are doing those things is try optimize designs, try to understand more about what's, what's happening. From the other case where if you have near surface gravel layers, CPTs rarely punch through those layers. So you need a borehole to punch through and understand what's exactly happening beneath it. Because it's either someone coming and telling you have gravel. If your gravel layer is only a meter thick, it's not going to help much with your liquefaction below it. So that's why you may start needing the boreholes as well. A combination of those, that information helps us work out which technical category or confirm what technical category you fall into. Because when they're developing the technical categories, it's sort of broad. But once you get the specific information, you know definitely you're in TC1, TC2, TC3. But also what level of settlements are, which informs the solutions moving forward. And I'll touch briefly, as I say, say 
depending on the, based on the information we, we obtain, then depending on the, so the settlement, then you can know, for example, if I'm in a TC2 type category, can I just adopt standard solutions? Or having, having done the investigations, something I forgot to mention at, the, at, at sort of at the start, is TC1 and TC2, especially in Christchurch, there is sometimes a misconception. It's purely to do with the liquefaction. There are areas classified as TC1 or TC2 where you have pit. Pit has its own problems. So by doing the investigations, you, you confirm, yes, I'm in TC2, but do I have other issues? And this way on the slide I'm saying, if it's TC2 and purely due to liquefaction, can I just adopt standard solutions? If I have pit, do I need to start thinking about piles so that I go beyond the pit layer? If it's a TC3 site, as I said, there is guidance, there are solutions which have been developed based on performance and experience. Which of those options can I better use? Because they all vary depending on whether you have lateral spread, major settlement, or minor settlement. And all that is just helping you align the solutions based on the information we get. And as per my last point is geotechnics is just a bit an input into the wider process. We more often have to talk to the contractors to know if you're going to repair, do you have access to do whatever you want? A whatever method you're going to adopt is the groundwater in your favor. Then also get structural input as whatever Mara is going to do to fit into the process. Uh, so uh, first part of the slide just covers the 18th of July presentation. Uh, so when we uh, start a new site, um, we, uh, there's this, that uh, table 2.3, which is uh, I'm sure you're familiar with the, uh, the indication of whether, whether it's worth looking at a, a, a re-level uh, repair or a rebuild um, as well. Uh, that is a starting point. Uh, looking at site is a key point, um, and uh, lo looking at the structure, uh, going through it, uh, understanding what the structure is, and uh, how it's likely to behave and how it has behaved. Uh, that's where homeowners are really important to, um, you know, say, say what's 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 happened, how it was before earthquakes, how it is after, if it's changing, um, and such. Uh, as Rob said, you know, geotechnical import is required um, as well, uh, and, and and that's um, useful when you turn up on site to know what to look, what to what to concentrate on, take notes of. As well, so the MBI guide, uh, guidance has has criteria to to direct um, the, the the repair or rebuild uh, scenario um, uh, based based on sediment, stretch, slopes, uh, visible damage uh, to site, and then also coupled with that, what what the ground performance has been and and is likely to be like. Uh, bearing capacity uh, is is required for if it's repair re level um, to see what what level you, know, you can you can use to lift a house up uh, for rebuild. It's also to find any new uh, foundations on or if there's a a problem with bearing at low levels, um, what what you need to do in terms of piling or or, or other other uh, rebuild strategies. Uh, you listen to SL sediment. Is, um, is is an indicator of what what the ground is expected to behave like uh, in in future events. Um, if if uh, there's poor uh, behaviour uh, forecast, then that's more indicator of of rebuild and foundation selection, uh, in particular. Uh, uh, and also coupled with that is lateral uh, lateral stretch, global lateral movement uh, as well. So there's there's Quite a uh, variety of factors that influence a um, the the repair or, or rebuild um, solution and the foundation choice if it does go to a foundation rebuild uh, as well. So the the, the guidance the guidance splits um, uh, is split into sections on TC1, TC2. Uh, those are the the uh, categories where uh, the liquefaction potential is lower. Um, May still have the peat issues. You, you can look at more traditional foundation systems, um, uh, or sorry, I should say traditional styles, slabs on grade, 
the NZS 364 Tim Frame Building uh, Perimeter Foundations um, and Piles, um, maybe TC2 Enhanced Perimeter Foundations is a term, and that's a reinforced concrete ring beam. Uh, and if it's a rebuild, there are other options in the, in the Section 5. Uh, TC3, that's because that's dealing with the ground performance and future performance, um, it deals a lot more with the different foundation options to look at how the ground behaves and how the uh, proposed, um, for rebels, the proposed foundations will behave uh, and so that they do will behave uh, adequately. Um, the TC3 foundations generally fall into the three categories. Uh, we've got ground improvement uh, with the TC2 surface structure, so that's the stone columns, um, gravel rafts, uh, ram aggregate piers, um, example with the TC2 foundation, so concrete slab on grade or the, or, or, or the shallow, or shallow surface piles uh, with timber flooring and um, concrete uh, perimeter foundation, if that's it. Uh, deep piles, uh, driven piles or board, um, it's another one. Um, they need to be carefully designed because, um, and, and TC3 uh, as well, because the land um, moves. Uh, liquefaction, lateral spread. Um, so the, it, it can't be, uh, it's not an easy choice to design a pile uh, for TC3. Um, there's a lot of uh, consideration and design to go into it. Uh, and then there are uh, surface structures. Uh, so um, from type one, type two, type three surface structures, you may have heard. They are designed to be easily relevelable in case of future event and provide uh, lateral restraint um, as appropriate to the site. They, they range between the uh, concrete slab style options and um, options for timber floors, um, which remain in the type one, type two um, slabs as well. So trying to... Um, I, I guess highlight that the, the, the liquefaction risk uh, is, is the driver towards the geotechnical investigation and how far you go uh, with that. Oh, so not how far you go, how far it is warranted to go with that investigation. The style, the, um, uh, the MB guidance covers number of boreholes, um, DCPs, hand augers, etc. Guidance is a basement for in, uh, basis for engineering judgment. Uh, it's a tool that is, is used as a, um, a broad means of compliance by council for consenting, but it is not part of the building code um, as such. It's not meant to be a compliance document. Um, we as designers uh, need to address several areas. The, uh, we need to meet the building code. Uh, we need to meet um, policy um, as well. Um, and, and, and the guidance... Guidance is generally towards the uh, the building code, meeting the building code. Um, I'm sure William can answer, um, explained earlier about that they, there was a deliberate choice not to try and cover policy because policy is so varied uh, from site to site. Variability in conditions from site to site. Um, it is a un unique situation. There is no uh, one size fits all. Um, there are there are beginning criteria, but they have to be customised to site uh, as well. And the, and the guidance recognises that and repeatedly states in it that it is only guidance, guidance engineering judgement and, and design is required, um, especially when you get near the, near the boundaries of, uh, of limits between areas. Uh, structural engineers um, need to interact with geotech um, engineers and off, uh, occasionally other specialist uh, engineering and um, professional experts. Um, normal for demanding sites. I think um, given the time since the first earthquakes, every site now is a demanding site. Um, and and it, it does, in, in practice, it evolves to and fro from, uh, from engineer to engineer to ensure that they do match. Um, council uh, insists they match. Insurers should insist they match. We try and make the match. Um, uh, Canterbury earthquakes has, um, has really highlighted what the what the key part that uh, foundations to pay uh, to play in residential areas uh, as well. Um, uh, TC3, um, so the reports really need 
have to address the ground conditions uh, as well. And and one of the early early parts for assessment of a property in TC3 is a geotechnical assessment uh, for that in order to point the point the strategy in the right direction. 